Hello everybody, the subject of today's video is medical mistakes. As usual there's no particular order to these stories, it's just a random selection of gruesome tales of medical malpractice, so enjoy. In 1957, a new wonder drug hit the pharmacy shelves in West Germany. It was called Contagan, and it was used to treat coughs, nausea and insomnia. It was found to be particularly effective for morning sickness, and became especially popular among pregnant women. It soon began to be marketed in various places across the world. In the UK, Australia and New Zealand, it was marketed as Distaval, a morning sickness pill and sedative, which, according to the advertisements, could be given with complete safety to pregnant women and nursing mothers without adverse effects on mother or child. It wasn't until around four years later that this wonder drug, nowadays better known as thalidomide, was quickly pulled from the shelves. During this time there had been a sudden spike in babies born with crippling deformities. Children with missing or severely malformed limbs was the most common mutation, but they also suffered from brain damage, facial disfiguration and blindness. In around 40% of cases, the child died either in the womb or shortly after being born. The cause of these deformities was, of course, thalidomide. In actual fact, the company that manufactured thalidomide, Kemi Grunenthal, knew that something was wrong with their drug almost from the beginning. Uh, Dr. Voss had written to the company warning them that a number of patients that he had prescribed the drug to had shown signs of nerve damage as a result of taking it. Over the coming months, more doctors would come forward to report the same thing. Although at this time it hadn't been linked to birth defects, it was clear that thalidomide wasn't as safe as the manufacturer said it was. Kemi Grunenthal, instead of taking the drug off the market, instead decided to hide these reports, even going as far as to hire private detectives to dig up damaging information about the doctors trying to blow the whistle on thalidomide. It wasn't until 1961 when an Australian doctor named William McBride raised the alarm about thalidomide and its effect on unborn fetuses. The drug was quickly removed from the shelves after that, but the damage was already done. By this time, between 10 and 20,000 children had been affected. The companies involved were made to pay large settlements to the families affected by thalidomide. Kemi Grunenthal had the biggest amount of victims to pay, and it had to make its money back somewhere. It had a sister company in Spain where drug safeguarding was a lot less strict than in Germany. They actually continued to market the drug there until the 1980s, specifically telling the distributors not to warn doctors about the drug's dangerous side effects. As a result, there are still around 300 thalidomide victims alive in Spain to this day. I could make an entire video just about botched cosmetic surgeries. The idea of someone being so self-conscious about the way they look that they're willing to go under the knife, only to be left with disfigurements even worse than when they went in, it seems a particularly cruel irony. Penile enhancement surgery is something that you definitely don't want to go wrong. Even when it doesn't go wrong, descriptions of the procedure still really give me the creeps. There's one technique that involves grafting a mesh made from the flesh of corpses onto the shaft of the penis to increase its girth. There's another one that involves attaching a device that slowly stretches the penis out to make it longer. But the method that really makes my skin crawl is where they inject a load of fat underneath the skin of the penis. It just gives me images in my head of some guy's dick looking like an overfilled water balloon but I'm not willing to look up images to confirm whether my suspicions are correct or not. 
Ronald Nance was a man with an average sized penis, but because of his large framed body, he thought it was too small compared to the rest of him. Despite reassurances from his girlfriend and her begging him not to get any surgery done, he was determined to get a cosmetic enhancement. He approached uh, Dr. Rosenstein, who had a reputation for performing such procedures. As described earlier, his technique was to make a small incision in the shaft and inject fat directly under the skin. Apparently he claimed it could add an extra two inches to its length when flaccid. Ronald had been saving money for a new truck, but when he heard about Dr. Rosenstein's procedure, he took his savings and used them to pay for the surgery. The procedure took about one hour, and although he was sore and swollen afterwards, the doctor assured him that everything was fine and sent him home to wait for the swelling to subside. That night, Ronald experienced the worst pain he had ever felt in his life. He awoke in the night to find that his dick had swollen so much that his foreskin had clamped shut, making it impossible for him to urinate. The incision sites had become infected and a yellow discharge was oozing from the wounds. In agony, he called up Dr. Rosenstein, who advised him to squeeze his penis as hard as he could to force out the buildup of fluids. By this point his member was so tender that he couldn't even handle the sensation of underwear brushing against it, and yet he was being made to squeeze it with all his strength. Obviously this didn't work, after a few days the swelling had gotten even worse. Ronald was starting to get sick from the infection, and he was quickly flown back to Dr. Rosenstein's surgery for an emergency circumcision. As the scalpel made the first incision, all of the fat that had been injected into the penis, along with the pus and fluids, spewed out all over the doctor. They were forced to remove a lot of the infected skin from the shaft. His dick was then stitched up and Ron was sent away. But by the time he got home, the stitches had burst open, leaving him with a long, gaping wound along his shaft. He would return to the doctor for three more emergency surgeries. Each time the sutures would reopen due to the swelling. In the end, they had to resort to stapling his wounds closed with metal pins. When the wounds finally did heal, he was horrified to discover that most of his penis had disappeared up inside his body, leaving it considerably shorter than when he first began the surgery. The part that was visible was a horribly deformed mass of scar tissue. In order to try and get it back to its original length, Dr. Rosenstein gave Ronald a heavy metal weight attached to a string, which he would tie to his penis at night and hang over the side of his bed. He also discovered that he was no longer able to achieve an erection. For this he was given a bag of needles. If he ever wanted to have sex, he would simply have to inject testosterone directly into the shaft. Ultimately, Ronald's girlfriend left him, and he was saddled with a further $17,000 in medical expenses. He says that his life has been completely ruined, and on a number of occasions he's even begged doctors to remove his penis completely. there's a condition known as pituitary dwarfism. It's when a person's pituitary gland doesn't produce enough growth hormones when they're growing up. The result, unsurprisingly, is that the person reaches adulthood without the usual growth spurts associated with puberty, and so they remain the same height they were as a child. The most common treatment is to inject them during childhood with a growth hormone. Since 1985, doctors have used a synthetic hormone, but before that, they would extract the hormone from the pituitary glands of donated corpses. The main company at the time that was responsible for collecting these growth hormones from corpses was a French organisation called France Hippophys. It was set up in 1973, and it would take extractions from organ donors and distribute these growth hormones all around the world. The problems began in 1983, when they started to import donor organs from Bulgaria and Hungary. 
A lot of these organs had come from donors who had died on neurological or infectious disease wards. Staff in these hospitals were given financial rewards for providing fresh pituitary glands and proper disease screening was not implemented. It wasn't until it was too late that they discovered a number of these organs were infected with Creutzfeldt's Jakob disease, perhaps better known today as mad cow disease. The problem with Creutzfeldt's Jakob disease is that it has a very long incubation period. People can carry the disease for many years without showing any symptoms at all. And once these symptoms do appear, the patient usually only has a few months left to live. Creutzfeldt's Jakob's disease, or CJD, attacks the brain tissue, turning the cortex into a spongy substance covered in tiny holes. The sufferer experiences a rapid onset of dementia. Within weeks, brain function is severely limited. They experience bouts of psychosis, memory loss and paranoia. Pretty soon their motor functions become completely impaired. The body becomes rigid and shakes uncontrollably. Limbs will contort and move about. Most people with CJD die within six months of the first symptoms showing, usually due to pneumonia because of the inability to cough up fluids that build up in the lungs. As you can probably guess, a number of children receiving growth hormone treatment in the early 80s were unwittingly injected with CJD. Amazingly, when CJD was first linked to growth hormone treatment in 1985, and although the treatment was stopped in many places around the world, in France they continued to administer it until at least 1990. They believed the CJD scare to be merely a marketing ploy to get people to start using the synthetic hormone instead, and so they refused to take it off the market. When a 50-year-old woman named Mrs. Arlene Windsor broke her hip, she thought that a cure would be simple. She might have to spend a few months in traction, but at least she would live to tell the tale. An x-ray showed that a hip was too damaged to heal properly on its own, and they decided that she would need a hip replacement operation. A hip replacement involves removing the top of the thigh bone and drilling down into the bone and hammering a metal spike into the hole. On top of the spike is a ball which sits inside the pelvis, acting as a replacement ball joint for the missing thigh bone. It's a fairly complicated operation because it's difficult for the surgeon to see where to insert the artificial hip. An x-ray monitor is required throughout the operation to get an accurate side view of the bone as they drive the spike into the leg. The problem is, when Mrs Windsor went in for her surgery, the x-ray technician assigned that day was very inexperienced and they were unable to get a clear image of the thigh bone. The surgeon tasked with installing the replacement joint was so frustrated with this novice x-ray technician that he sent him away and rang the x-ray department to send over someone more experienced. He was told that every other technician was unavailable and despite many calls he was unable to find a replacement for the person he'd dismissed. After waiting for over an hour, he decided he couldn't delay the operation any longer he would have to attempt to install a hip joint without the aid of an x-ray image. Going in completely blind, he tried to hammer the spike into Mrs Windsor's thigh bone, but he botched it badly. The tip of the spike pierced the sciatic nerve. Now the sciatic nerve is the largest and most sensitive nerve in the human body. To have a metal spike driven through this nerve would cause unimaginable pain. But without the aid of the x-ray image, he didn't realise what he'd done, and so he finished the operation with the prosthetic hip joint in place. Mrs Windsor awoke from the surgery in complete agony. Not even the strongest painkillers could block out the pain. She endured this agony for two months before she could be scheduled for another surgery to correct the mistake. 
This new surgery involved a completely different set of tools. The thigh was reopened and the surgeon would use a diamond tipped electric saw to cut the tip of the metal spike so that it was no longer piercing through the sciatic nerve. However, an inexperienced intern was tasked with holding the flesh retractor whilst the surgeon sawed through the spike. Just as he was beginning to saw through the metal, the intern's hand slipped, letting go of the retractor, which in turn caused the surgeon to slip with the saw and cut right through Mrs. Windsor's sciatic nerve. If she thought she was in pain before, this was nothing compared to the agony of having the nerve sliced through completely. She came round from the surgery in such extreme pain that she could barely think. Along with this constant pain, she was also no longer able to move her leg properly. She required a special brace just to be able to stand. Pretty soon she was unable to put any pressure on the leg at all and so she was mostly wheelchair bound. In order to control the pain, she was given extremely strong narcotics, but these made her very lethargic and depressed. A medical malpractice case was filed to sue the hospital for damages, but just days before going to court, in a desperate attempt to end the constant agony, Mrs. Windsor took the last of her painkillers, placed a plastic bag over her head and suffocated herself to death. For the last story, I wanted to find something about surgeons accidentally leaving objects inside a patient, but then I looked it up and apparently this happens so often that it's hard to pick just one case. If you want a good scare, just go and study the statistics yourself. The average surgery requires around 300 separate instruments to be used. If it's a major surgery, the figure can rise to around 600 different pieces of medical equipment. Although the medical staff do go to great lengths to account for each piece of equipment, when you consider all of the thousands of surgeries carried out in any given year, and all the equipment that's used in those surgeries, it's inevitable that somewhere along the way, some of that equipment does go missing, only to end up sewn inside a person's body. Now, I'm reading this straight from Wikipedia, so you might be able to find a less alarming statistic. The Patient Safety Monitor Alert announced in 2003, around 1,500 tools were stitched into patients each year. However, the exact number is impossible to count and it's believed to be highly underreported. The most common object left inside patients is a surgical sponge. And in a lot of cases, this can be completely harmless. A lot of people can go for years or even their entire lives without realizing that they've got a foreign object sewn into their body. In some cases, however, the sponges can begin to rot and fester, causing a large abscess inside the body. In more extreme cases, sharp metal objects like needles and scalpels are left inside a person, which slowly work their way through the body, piercing flesh and organs as they go. These objects can be left unnoticed inside patients for years, despite them complaining about pains in their body. Eventually, the flesh will begin to grow around these objects, and when they're finally discovered and they attempt to remove them, they can often find that they've fused with nearby organs, and so removing the objects becomes an extremely risky procedure, oftentimes with the patient losing vital organs as a result. One particularly nasty case I've heard of is of a woman in France who went in for surgery on her uterus. After the surgery, she was in extreme pain and experiencing an unnatural amount of cramps, so she went back to the doctors. They assured her that the sensations were quite normal for someone who's just had surgery and they sent her home again with a few stronger painkillers. However, the pain only got worse and three days later, she began to have severe contractions as if she was about to give birth. She felt the urge to push, and when she did, out of her vagina came a surgical glove, five cloth compresses, and a whole lot of clotted blood. And this isn't even an isolated case. 
There's another account of a woman in England who went in for a hysterectomy and three days later gave birth to a surgical glove in a very similar way. The most extreme case I've heard of is that of Dirk Schroeder. He went in for surgery on his prostate. He experienced an unusual amount of pain during his recovery, but the doctors assumed it was just his body healing, until months later when a nurse noticed a bandage was poking out from inside Mr Schroeder's stitches. It turned out that the surgeons had left 16 different objects, including needles and a face mask inside his body, and it took two further surgeries to remove them completely. Now, although I've covered some horrible cases today and some of these statistics might seem a bit scary, the likelihood of something going wrong is still extremely low. I'm saying this because I've been through two operations myself, and one of them was a major operation where I was on the operating table for over eight hours with my abdomen completely cut open, but I'd be dead now if I hadn't had them done. I wouldn't like to think of someone putting off a life-saving procedure just because they watched this video. A lot of these cases date back many decades, and modern medicine has made some incredible advances, even in just the last few years. I have cherry-picked some of the worst case scenarios, but the chances of something like this happening to you is so low that it's not even worth worrying about. If you do have some kind of medical procedure coming up and you're scared about it, just remember that you're going through the worst part right now. The worrying about it beforehand is always worse than the actual procedure itself. And believe me, I've been there and I learned that the hard way, so... Like I say, don't put off something just because you watched one video on YouTube. But anyway, with that out of the way, I just want to say thank you very much for watching. And I want to say special thank you to everyone who's supported me on Patreon this month. And apologies if I don't pronounce your name correctly. And quiet, Brandon, Carla Hoffman, Katjika, Claudia Moreira, Damon Smith, Diane M. Fields, Duct Tape Master, James Sorensen, Caden Cometzer Nelson, Kirsty Jones, Marcus Kiro, Neil Pocky G, Rocket Guitarists, Tootsie Tickler, and Vigard Bratton. Also a huge thanks to those who have donated on PayPal this month. Chris Bolland, Jack Kiso, Daniel Moore, and Vladimir Thornton. Thank you to all those people. I usually record the audio part of my videos earlier in the week, so if anyone has signed up or donated after Wednesday, I apologise for missing you out and I'll get you next time. I'll try and do a shout out on these longer videos. Thank you so much to everyone, it's uh, really helping me out. And if you'd like to become a supporter, then uh, there's a link to my Patreon and PayPal in the description. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, goodbye.